We will rejoice in the Lord of high. We lift our voice to worship the Lord of high. We will rejoice. We will rejoice in the Lord. Most high, we will lift our voice. We will lift our voice. Worship the Lord. Most high, we have come. We have come to praise Your name. To sing Your song to the nation. To declare that Jesus reigns, we will rejoice before Him. We will, we will rejoice in the Lord Most High. We will live the Lord. We lift our voice to worship the Lord, the Most High. We will rejoice. We will rejoice in the Lord, the Most High. Sing, we lift our voice. We lift our voice to worship the Lord. Most high, we have come, we have come to praise your name and to sing your song, to sing your song to the nation, to declare that Jesus reign. We will rejoice for me. We will rejoice in the Lord, Most High. We will lift our voice to worship the Lord, Most High. We will lift our voice to worship the Lord, Most High. We will rejoice in the Lord, Most High. We will rejoice in the Lord, Most High. We will rejoice in the Lord, we lift our voice to worship the Lord. We will rejoice. We will rejoice. We will rejoice in the Lord. The Most High. Sing, we lift the voice. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Okay, we're going to have an encore. <laughs> All right, hallelujah, glory to God. I tell you, I am so full today. I really am so full today, especially coming after Thursday. Okay, if you didn't listen to Thursday, okay, Thursday and then things that have been happening since then. Let me tell you something, this walk is awesome. This walk is really, really awesome. And I am so full with what... Uh, um, God has given me for you guys today, so uh, I'm looking forward to it, and hopefully I can contain some of my excitement. Okay, I I'll try. I'll try real hard. <laughs> Let it go. Oh, I don't know. Blow the roof off. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Marcia Austin, if you could open us up in prayer.
Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you, God, that we can come together again to worship you, God, to hear from you, Father God. And we are so excited and anxious. Just as our pastors, we are always anxious, Father God, for your word. Father God, we love being in your presence. We love, Father God, being around each other. Father, thank you for all that you do in our life, Father God. We give you praise and honor and glory, for we know there is truly none like you, Father. And we thank you, Father God, that you have given us this life, Father God, to serve you, Father God, to walk this walk, Father God, that you have given us, O oh God. Continually, Father God, teach us, Father God, your word and your truth, Father God, that we may go out and be that hand extended to your mouth, everything, Father God, that you have faith in us, that we will do. Father, thank you for healing us and for giving us all the things that you have given us. We are yes. grateful. I pray that you, God, that you continually bless our pastor Israel, Father God, and you have given her insights, Father God. All these things you've given us, given her for us, Father, we are truly grateful. Father, thank you for healing us. Father, we love you. We give praise and honor and glory to you. In the name of Yeshua, amen. Amen, 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 amen. We have Brad doing uh, double duty today. He's getting his 10,000 steps in. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Brad. Uh, keep Jenny, okay, and her family in prayer. You know, she's still dealing with a, a situation, you know, but God has it all in control. Praise Yah. All right. So uh, as he gets every everything ready, you know, uh, let's go for our next portion. <laughs> Well, shalom once again, everybody. I'm Bill Cloud, and welcome to On This Day. It was on this day that the historian Josephus, along with tradition, believes that Titus and the Roman legions began the battering operations against the outer wall of the temple court. Of course, this will culminate a week later in the complete destruction of the temple. Now, as we know, Messiah prophesied a generation before that this would indeed happen. We read in Matthew 24 that he said, Truly, I say to you, that there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Now the question is, at least for me, why the destruction of the temple and why so completely? Here's my opinion. Because at some point, the temple of the first century had ceased to function in its intended design. It wasn't doing what the creator wanted it to do. The temple, the tabernacle before, came into being because the Creator wanted a dwelling where He could reside amongst His people. But at some point, this temple had become a showpiece. It was more about what it looked like, and it had become an institution, and some could even argue an industry. And so, in fact, when Yeshua says this about the destruction of the temple, it's in response to the disciples calling his attention to the wonderful stones and the beautiful buildings of the temple. And so, again, in some sense, God's people had forgotten what they were supposed to be doing and what the temple was truly to represent. They had forgotten the purpose of the temple. Consequently, they had forgotten their purpose. It was all about his presence being amongst them so that they could be a light to the nations. But again, they turned it into an institution, an industry, and in some cases, even a marketplace. In short, they had forgotten the foundation of their faith and consequently their mission as a people. So now compare that with the statement that Yeshua says about his house, what his house is supposed to be. In fact, this comes in Matthew 16 when Peter declares that he is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. To that, Yeshua says in Matthew 16, on this rock, the rock being the statement that and the declaration that Yeshua is the Messiah and the Son of God. On this rock, I will build my church or my congregation, my kahal, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, his house is built on a sure and trustworthy foundation. And his house established on that foundation will stand. Any other house and any other foundation, even if it looks like God's house, is and will eventually be buffeted by the enemy. It will be battered by the forces of the adversary just as surely as the first temple was attacked by the Romans. You know, Jerusalem in that day saw its gates come under siege. 
and its gates fell. The gates of the temple came under siege, and those gates fell. Why? Because again, at some point in time, God's people had forgotten the foundation. They had forgotten their mission. And so the forces of the adversary were given allowance to come against the gates of God's house. Only problem was, by that point in time, God wasn't there. Here's the way it's supposed to work. When we recognize the foundation of our faith, Yeshua and Him crucified, that He is the Messiah and the Son of the living God. When we build on that, when we're part of His kingdom, His purposes, and the kingdom of heaven is something that is to be advancing, not retracting, we may face, well, we will face adversity, we will face trials, there will be those things that will come against us, but we will stand. We won't fail if we place our trust and our confidence in Him. When we're standing on what's true, we can believe Him when He says that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against us. But you see, the gates of hell don't come against us in Matthew 16. The idea is when we are doing what we're supposed to be doing and standing on what is sound and sure and true, then we are expanding with the kingdom of heaven. We're, we're advancing. And when we encounter the obstacles, when we encounter the gates of hell, they won't be able to stand. And so here are my thoughts today based on what we're talking about. We are going to go through trials. We're going to go through tests. We're going to be buffeted by the enemy. But when we are standing on what is true, as I've already said, we may feel the heat, but will not fall because we're standing on that rock. But if we go out and build on something else, then ladies and gentlemen, when we're buffeted, we may fall. The reverse of that is when we are doing what we're supposed to be doing, functioning in our purpose, doing what the Creator has called us to do, standing on the truth of His Word and the Messiah, then all the obstacles that we will face will eventually fall. The gates of hell shall not prevail against us. So as we go out today and we meet the challenges that we're going to be faced with, and we meet the obstacles that we're going to be faced with, then stop and remember that if you're standing on the truth, if you're standing on the fact that Yeshua came to this earth, and he walked a life and, and led a life to set an example for you and to me to follow him. And we are standing on the truth that he is the Messiah and the son of the living God and that he has overcome the world. And so now we can overcome the world. When we face those obstacles, they eventually will dissolve. They eventually will fall under the weight of truth. Those are my thoughts for today. I hope they blessed you in some way. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you tomorrow on On This Day. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. Do me a favor. Um, uh, while we're waiting for Brad, I want you to turn to that scripture in Matthew chapter 16. I'll start at verse number 13. I'm going to show you something. Okay, with this. And some of this goes back uh, as he was talking uh, uh, to this. I'm going to go over a little bit of it uh, today and just mention. We know gates. Gates are what? Places where decisions are made. All right. A gate is a place that can keep something out or keep something in. That's the function of a gate. But the gates in Bible times were places where judgments were made, decisions, okay, were made. So that everything that entered, like the elders and the judges would sit at that gate, they would make decisions. Everything going into that place then is governed by the decisions that are made at that particular gate. You understand what I'm saying? Once you are out of the gate, you're no longer under that jurisdiction. All right. So I want to go over this and just show you uh, something and some things that we have misunderstood in our 
Christian walk, which is why it is so important for you to understand the Bible the way the original design and intent of the Bible was meant to understand and not the way that our traditions have caused us to understand it. Because if you understand it according to the traditions and you pray according to your understanding of the traditions, a lot of times that's why you don't get an answer. You understand? That's also why you don't get results the way that you think that you should, because you are not praying according to the original intent of that particular scripture. So it's just like, you know, this is in Hebrew and you're speaking Chinese when you're praying and the person you're speaking to is saying, I don't understand what it is that you want. And you're all this. And I don't understand why he doesn't understand me. OK, so let's start at verse number 13. When Yeshua came into the coast of Caesarea, I'm sorry, uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Now, remember, son of man, okay, is a messianic term. Okay, so he's already told him that he is the son of man. All right. And they say, some say that thou art John the Baptist. All right. Now they're thinking that he is the John the Baptist that is reincarnated, maybe because John the Baptist had what? OK, he had already uh, uh, been killed at that point. But we know John the Baptist operated in whose spirit? Right. The spirit and power of Elijah. Some say Elias. OK, there we go. Why? Because of his miracles. OK, some say others, Jeremiah. Why Jeremiah? because he was constantly preaching about the new covenant the way Jeremiah did, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Going back again to Elias, you must look at the miracles also that he did, because he did miracles according to the prophets also. All right, so that lets you know the people were, they were acquainted with the word. Because if I am comparing you to something, I've got to know what that something is in order that when I see you doing the same things, I can say you are like this right here. OK, so that is one of the things that they knew. OK, so whom do men say that I am? Then he gets personal. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered. OK, answered and said, thou art the Mashiach, the anointed one, the son of the living Elohim, God. And Yeshua answered and said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my father, which is in heaven. Sometimes we are praying for revelation by men. See, this is why he does this exercise. Who do men say that I am? All right. In other words, is your understanding of me based upon what other people are saying about me or by personal revelation that you have gotten about me? You understand what I'm saying? OK, because you need to know that, because if you don't know how somebody is looking at something, you don't know how to change their vision if they're wrong. That's why when you go to an optometrist office, he may take your glasses. But what does he do? He puts that machine on, okay, and he sees once again how you are seeing things so that he knows how to correct. See, one reason is you may take these glasses, but by the time you go to the eye doctor again, your vision may have changed. So he cannot necessarily start you out where you are. He has to get a range of where you have been, where you are, in order to take you where you have been. So he has to make that personal. You need to ask yourself, who do I say that Yeshua is? You understand? Is your understanding of the Torah based upon what you heard someone said, or is it by personal revelation? There's a big difference because if you are, your revelation is based upon what someone else says, then you will do always what they say. When it is based upon that personal revelation of who he is, then that's the Holy Spirit in you, leading you and guiding you into all truth. Why do we get into cults? 
We get into cults because we do things that other people say, okay? Who do they say that I am? And we follow along with that, all right? Instead of knowing for ourselves. Okay, so he goes on to say, once again, verse 17, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. In other words, there are going to be some things that only the Holy Spirit can understand. You can see everything. Now, they were with him seeing everything that he was doing, but only the Holy Spirit within them could tell them why and how he was doing it, what power he was doing it, okay? And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and uh, Bill Cloud very aptly explained that, my assembly, my kahal, Okay, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay, when you say hell in the church, you think fire, brimstone, okay, all of this place of final judgment and all that. Am I right? Is that not what we were taught? So people were afraid of hell. Am I right? All right. But that's not what the word meant. That's what man said it meant. You understand what I'm saying? That's what man, so everything you did was based upon uh, something someone told you about hell. However, if you have your, uh, and I don't mind people using their cellular devices, okay, when we go to like the uh, Blue Letter Bible, or you can turn in, if you have a keyword study Bible, you can go to, what is it, Greek number 86, I think it is. Okay, 86. Wait a minute and, and until this comes up. Okay, so you have to understand what hell is. We talked about gates. In your mind, the gates of hell. That's, you know, a place with bars and all of that and people beating on one side of it to get out. There's no one beating on the other side to get in based upon what our okay, understanding is. I want you to think about it. When you understand that hell is not that place of fire and brimstone, but hell is, it's in the Bible as the grave, the grave. Do people beat on that other side to get in there? Answer is yes. If you have a suicidal spirit. You understand what I'm saying? When you understand hell as the grave, people who want who are suicidal, they believe they are in hell. Their life is in hell. You understand what I'm saying? So eventually that hell, they're beating on that gate to get out of this life into death. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, with that. So you have to understand hell okay, in the Bible, is not the place of final judgment. And I can't understand why we never, actually I do now, understand why we always thought that when in the book of Revelation, it says death and hell are going to be cast into the lake of fire. So how could hell be that final resting place if hell is scared? Oh, that's something that hell is scared of. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? But we still did not pay attention to what was going on in the book of Revelation. And we still kept our understanding of what hell was. And when we talk to people, especially in the Pentecostal church, oh, if you do this, you're going to. All right, if I misbehave, I'm going to. Come on. <laughs> Get mad at you and I'm sending you to. Oh, come on now. <laughs> come on. I'm laughing, but uh, it's really not funny. Okay, hold on. Let me get up this gate. Uh, okay, to hell. I was not looking for. So we've established that a gate is a place where a decision is made. All that go through there are governed by it. We've established. Now I'm going to go to the word here, G86. Click on it. Uh, and um, I know Brad is probably in the other room. 
Okay, there. If you have your Blue Letter Bible, okay, once again, you can go to that and then just scroll down. Let me make this a little bit larger so that those who are in the room can see. Well, that's kind of big there. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so we see the uh, K, uh, King James Version translates strong G86 in the following manner, hell and grave. Okay, now, where did we get the idea that it was a place of torments? The Greeks, okay, the Greeks, because it's the name of Hades, Pluto, the gods of the lower gates. Can you remember in all that mythology that we learned in school that that was a place where souls, departed souls went for torment? Am I right? So I want you to think about it. That understanding that we had all those years in the church was based upon Greek mythology. That's a scary thought. Because we're tongue talking, hand clapping, foot stomping. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So I need you to understand why then some people may come to you sometimes and say that your religion is based upon mythology. I want you to, and then we get so indignant because I'm hand clapping, foot stomping. <laughs> okay. I got the Holy Ghost. Okay. All right. But if your understanding is based upon something that is in mythology and someone who is familiar with mythology listens to how you are explaining something, you can't tell them that they are wrong. You understand? And then when you say the Holy Spirit revealed this to me, they're going to look at you like you're crazy because they understand where you're getting your theology from. You understand what I'm saying? So do you understand why, you know, we perish for a lack of knowledge? We don't win souls and souls are perishing for a lack of knowledge. Why? Because when somebody look, if you look at an apple and someone comes along and tells you it's a banana, and you know it's an apple, you're not gonna go along with them. I don't care who they are, they are wrong. So we see here in the definitions, the uh, name Hades or Pluto, the gods, small g, okay, of the lower regions, Orcus, the nether world, the realm of the dead. This is all Greek and Roman theology. Greek and Roman theology, oh my. Who had been in charge of uh, Israel for hundreds of years? The Greeks and the Romans. So do you see how their theology was able to creep in to the beginnings of Christianity, especially once Christianity synchronized with some of the things that were Okay, from Roman, especially during the times of Constantine and all that. So you can see, you can get an understanding, okay, of that. However, later use of this word, the grave, death, and hell. Okay, so a place of the grave. So when you die, you go to hell. But they mean grave. Sheol was grave. Okay, it was grave. The only, um, let me see here. Okay, uh, um, it denotes biblical Greek orcus, infernal regions, a dark and dismal place, a, the common receptacle of disembodied spirits, according to very common ellipsis. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So much for that. Okay. All right, then uh, you can find out all of the other scriptures that is that, that is in. So we've established what a gate is. We've established what hell is, and he says, hell shall not, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So, therefore, if hell is the grave, the reason that he says the gates of the grave shall not prevail against your revelation, because he was one that came to do what? Raise the dead from the grave.
So in other words, when you become a believer, the grave cannot hold you. Oh, oh, come on now, you understand? The gates of hell cannot prevail against a believer. Hallelujah. So he goes on <clears throat> and says, I will give unto thee the keys. Okay, keys are something that can lock or unlock. <clears throat> if something is locked, you are prevented from access to it. That locked door stops you from entering in here. But if you have the appropriate key, you can open the door and enter in. So a key can either prevent access or give access. We understand that? So therefore, he says, I shall give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, what he's given you is a set of the master key. A set of the master key. Now, a master key can unlock any door. Come on now. Okay, it can unlock any door and it can lock up any door. You understand what I'm saying? And he goes on and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So do you understand in order, if you have the power of God through the revelation of God on earth as it is in heaven, when you use those keys, you can prevent or you can permit based upon what the word of God says. In other words, you properly use your authority in the name of Yeshua. The key gives you the right to use the name of Yeshua because you are using his authority. Let me tell you something. How many of you just go out and make a hundred keys and whoever keys to your house, whoever you see on the street, you just go give them a key. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to do that, right? You're only going to give a key to someone who you want to have access to your things. Oh, come on. Come on. Someone who you are empowering to have access to. Or someone, if you are house sitting, that means when you aren't there, you have given someone the power to come in Watch over your stuff, and when they leave, they make sure it's locked up so that no one else can get to it. You understand what I'm saying? So when he gives us the keys of the kingdom, we are effectively house-sitting. So let me tell you something. You aren't going to let someone sit in your house if you know they have a lifestyle where all they do is party, have drugs, and do all kinds of uh, things like that. No, you're not. You understand what I'm saying? Because your house is like your kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm saying all this so you get the power behind what he is saying and what he has bestowed upon us because of the revelation that we have of who he is. Not what someone else said, but our personal revelation. Once we understand that and you get that personal revelation, then he can give you a key because you'll know what I like in my house. You'll know what my word says I permit and you know what my word says I forbid. I don't have to be down here watching you. I can be there because I know whatever you're doing here is what I would have done if I was here, <clears throat> okay? And I know that if, okay, it's not gonna happen, you don't make it happen, it's because you know I wasn't going to permit it. You understand? So he gives you the power that he, you shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. Whatso thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You understand that? So once you understand the Torah, which is why Yeshua in the wilderness with, the, with uh, Satan said, it is written. That is your most powerful revelation. Okay, because if you have given, if I've given you the keys to the house, I've given you written instructions on what I want done in my house when I'm not there. Come on. 
And if you obey those instructions, guess what? When I come back and I see everything in order, you get to keep the key. Because I know if I need something, I got someone who I can trust who can go take care of it as if it were me doing it. You understand? That's the power we get in that revelation. All right. You can only bind that which is written to be bound on earth. Once again, that's why Torah is so important. Torah gives you the earthly instructions for the what's going on in the heavens so that you do on earth as it is done in heaven. You see, he didn't write it on cloud nine. He gave it to us in a form that we can understand. So you have the power through the revelation that as he says, the gates of hell, get, let me tell you something. When you are saved and sanctified and all of that and you die, you will rise again. That body will be, this is just like a suitcase. <laughs> okay, <laughs> stuff in it. When the, when the trip is over, what, what do you do? You take the stuff out when you need it again, you put everything back in it. This is just a temporary dwelling, okay? When he returns, if we are alive and remain, guess what? We'll be with him, okay? If we are not alive when he returns, he says the dead in Christ shall do what? Rise when? First, okay? In other words, you can't keep a good man down. <laughs> or in other words, the gates of hell will not prevail against preventing you from rising again. And let me tell you something. When you rise that next time, okay, you will be with him taking vengeance upon everything that hindered you in this lifetime. We're going to go over that with the blood avenger today. All right. So I just wanted to go over that little ditty with you guys. And I think uh, uh, Miriam is waiting very patiently. Okay, behind me. To go over the Torah portion summary. <laughs> Shabbat shalom. I will be reading the portion summary and this week in Bible history. Matot. We have a double portion this week. The name of the 42nd reading from the Torah is Matot, which means tribes. The name is derived from the words of Numbers 30, verse 1, which says, then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Numbers 30 discusses the laws of vows and oaths. Numbers 31 tells the story of Israel's war with Midian. Numbers 32 relates the story of how the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh came to inherit the land east of the Jordan River. Except in biblical calendar leap years, Matot is read together with the subsequent Torah portion, Masai, on the same Sabbath. Masai. The last reading from the book of Numbers is called Masai, a word that means journeys. It comes from the verse, first verse of the reading, which be, begins with the words, these are the journeys of the sons of Israel. Numbers 33, verse 1. Masai is the end of the continuous narrative of Torah that began in Genesis with the creation of the universe. The narrative does not resume until the end of Deuteronomy when Moses dies. The final reading in Numbers settles several last-minute details. In it, we find a list of the encampments from Egypt to the plains of Moab. We also find instructions for apportioning the land as well as the specifics regarding the borders of the land. While explaining the land and its borders, Moses introduces the laws of the cities of refuge and more inheritance laws. In most years, synagogues read Messiah together with the preceding portion, Matot, which, acts, which accounts for the brevity of this portion's commentary. This week in Bible history, the passing of Aaron, 1274 BCE. Aaron, the first high priest, brother of Moses and Miriam, passed away at age 123 on the first of Av, of the year 2487 from creation, 1274 BCE. This is the only Ya'er Za'it date of passing explicitly mentioned in the Torah, Numbers 33, verses 38. 
Ezra arrives in Israel 30, 348 BCE. Following the long journey from Babylon, see Jewish history for the 12th of Nisan, Ezra and his entourage arrived in the land of Israel to be near the newly built Second Holy Temple in Jerusalem. A relatively small group came together with Ezra, the majority of Jews, including great Torah scholars, choosing to remain in Babylon due to the harsh conditions that were then prevailing in Israel. Katrina? Shabbat Shalom. I'll be reading Matthew 5, 33-36. And again, we have heard that that has been said, told to them. I mean, excuse me. That told, no, no, by them at all. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me pay. Time. Thou shalt forswear thyself, but be born unto the Lord, thy oath. But I say unto you, swear, not all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by head, because thou canst not make one hair, white, or black. But let your communication be ye, 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 and nay, nay. For, for so ever is more than these that come of, of evil. Grace. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. I'll be reading James 4, 1 through 12. Okay. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not ye killed and desire to have and cannot obtain? Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that they may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of Elohim. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lust to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he said, Elohim resist the proud, but give grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to Elohim. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to Elohim, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaven, heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of Yahweh, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judge his brother speaks evil of the law and judge the law. But if you speak, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou? that judges another. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. This is Renee reading from the JPS Tanakh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1, to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3, beginning at verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkah, one of the priests at Anoch, in the territory of Benjamin. The word of Yahweh came to him in the days of King Josiah, 
son of Ammon of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. And throughout the days of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, and until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, when Jerusalem went into an exile in the fifth month, the word of Yahweh came to me. Before I created you in the womb, I selected you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet concerning the nation. I replied, Ah, oh, Adonai Yahweh, I don't know how to speak, for I'm still a boy. And Yahweh said to me, Do not say I'm still a boy, but go wherever I send you, and speak whatever I command you. Have no fear of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares Yahweh. And Yahweh put out his hand and touched my mouth. And Yahweh said to me, Herewith I put my words into your mouth. See, I appointed you this day over nations and kingdoms to uproot and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of Yahweh came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I replied, I see a branch of an almond tree. And Yahweh said to me, You have seen right, for I am watchful to bring my word to pass. And the word of Yahweh came to me a second time. What do you see? I replied, I see a steaming pot tipped away from the north. And Yahweh said to me, From the north shall disaster break loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. For I am summoning all the peoples of the kingdoms of the north, declares Yahweh. They shall come and shall each set up its throne before the gate of Jerusalem, against its walls round about, against all the towns of Judah. And I will argue my case against them for all their wickedness. They have forsaken me and sacrificed to other elves, to other gods, and worshiped the works of their hands. So you, third of your loins, arise and speak to them all that I command you. Do not break down before them lest I break you before them. I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against Judah's kings and officers, against his priests and citizens. They will attack you, but they shall not overcome you. For I am with you, declares Yahweh to save you. Chapter 2, verse 1. The word of Yahweh came to me, saying, Go proclaim to Jerusalem, thus saith Yahweh, I counted to your favor the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Verse 3. Israel was holy to Yahweh, the first fruit of his harvest. All who ate of it were held guilty, disaster befell them, declares Yahweh. Shabbat Shalom. Jeremiah 2, 4 to 28. Just getting my glasses here. I do re read without it sometimes, but yeah. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, all you clans of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts, deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives? I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce. 
but you came and defiled my land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord and I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coasts of Kittim and look, send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all, but my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Is Israel a servant, a slave by birth? Why then has he become plunder? Lands have roared. They have growled at him. They have laid waste his land. His towns are burned and deserted. Also, the men of Memphis and Tapanes have shaved the crown of your head. Have you not brought this on yourselves by forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? Now you go to Egypt to drink water from the Shehor. And why go to Assyria to drink water from the river? Your wickedness will punish you. Your backsliding will rebuke you. Consider then and realize how evil and bitter it is for you when you forsake the Lord your God and have no awe of me, declares the Lord, the Lord Almighty. Long ago, you broke off your yoke and tore off your bonds. You said, I will not serve you. Indeed, on every high hill and under every spreading tree, you lay down as a prostitute. I had planted you like a choice vine of sound and reliable stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? Although you wash yourself with soda, and use an abundance of soap. The stain of your guilt is still before me, declares the Sovereign Lord. How can you say I'm not defiled? I have not run after the Baals. See how you behaved in the valley? Consider what you have done. You are a swift she-camel, running here and there, a wild donkey, accustomed to the desert sniffing the wind in her craving. In her heat, who can restrain her? Any males that pursue her need not tire themselves. At mating time, they will find her. Do not run until your feet are bare and your throat is dry. But you said, it's no use. I love foreign gods and I must go after them. As a thief is disgraced when he is caught, So the house of Israel is disgraced. They, their kings and their officials, their priests and their prophets. They say to wood, you are my father. And to stone, you gave me birth. They have not turned their backs to me and not their faces. Yet when they are in trouble, they say, come and save us. Where then are the gods you made for yourselves? Let them come. If they can save you when you are in trouble, for you have as many gods as you have towns, O Judah. Amen. Oh, my sidekick was, you know. (laughs) 
Shabbat Shalom. I will be reading Malek Mashiach's genealogy. This week's reading is a double portion incorporating two parishots, Mitat and Masse. I have chosen to focus my attention on Parashat Masse because of its relevance to the kingship of Mashiach, the Messiah, the Messiah, Yeshua. Numbers 36 and 1. The heads of the Avat, the father houses of the family of Benai Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, of the families of the sons of Joseph, came near and spoke before Moses and before the princes, the heads of the houses of the children of Israel. And they said, Yahweh commanded my Lord to give the land of the inheritance by Lot, the children of Israel. And my Lord was commanded by Yahweh to give the inheritance of Zelohad, our brothers, to his daughters. If they be married to any of the sons of the other tribes of the children of Israel, then would their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of our fathers and will be added to the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they shall belong. So will it be taken away from the lot of our inheritance? <clears throat> when the Yovo, the Jubilee, of the children of Israel shall be, then will their inheritance be added to the inheritance of the tribe whereunto they shall belong. So will their inheritance be taken away from the inheritance of the tribe of our fathers. Moses commanded the children of Israel according to the word of Yahweh, saying, The tribe of the sons of Joseph speaks right. This is the thing which Yahweh does commanding concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, Let them be married to whom they think best. Only unto the family of the tribe of their father shall they be married. So shall no inheritance of the children of Israel removed from tribe to tribe. For the children of Israel shall cleave everyone to the inheritance of the tribe of his father. Every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be wife to one of the family of the tribe of her father. That the children of Israel may possess every man the inheritance of his father. So shall no inheritance removed from one tribe to another for the tribes of the children of Israel shall cleave every one to his own inheritance. Certainly you would be correct in asking, what can this mitzvah, this command, possibly have to do with kingship of Yeshua? Allow me to explain. Of the four gospel writers, only Luke and Matthew give us any information about the genealogy of Mashiach. Each, however, gives a totally different perspective. Matthew traces Yeshua's genealogy through his stepfather, Joseph. And as you read through Matthew's genealogy, Joseph plays an active role while Miriam, known as Mary, his mother, plays a passive role. Luke traces Yeshua's genealogy through Mary. As you read Luke's genealogy, Mary plays an active role while Joseph plays a passive role. It is not by accident that we have these two perspectives. It was ordained by God as such. Why? Matthew's genealogy tells us that Joseph was a direct descendant of King Jeconiah. This is exactly what is significant about his genealogy. King Jeconiah, also referred to in scripture as Keniah, had a curse pronounced against him by Yahweh. See Jeremiah 22, 24 through 30. This curse started that, no, that none of Jeconiah's descendants would ever have the right to sit on the throne of David and be king of Israel. Joseph was a direct descendant of King Jeconiah, therefore he was not an heir to the throne of Israel. If Yeshua therefore was in fact Joseph's son, he could not be Melech Israel, which means king of Israel. That is why in Matthew 1.16, Matthew expresses, expresses the virgin birth of Yeshua. Matthew 1.16, and Yaqub, Jacob, begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Yeshua, who is called Mashiach. Please note that the of whom referred to in this scripture is in the feminine tense and therefore refers to Miriam and not Joseph. In composing the passage this way, Matthew leads Joseph out of the reproductive process 
indicating that to Miriam was born Yeshua and not to both of them. Luke also expresses the virgin birth of Yeshua at the very beginning of his genealogy. Luke 3.23, and Yeshua himself began to be about 30 years of age, being and was supposed the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. In presenting his genealogy, Luke followed strict Jewish law. He did not mention any woman, not even Mary, even though it was through her his genealogy is taken. Luke shows how Yeshua can be the king of Israel because he was from the house of David, but not through the line of King Jeconiah. David's lineage in Matthew was traced through the King Solomon, which ended at Jeconiah and the curse. Luke, however, shows us that Mary's lineage through her father Eli traces through David's other brother Nathan, which bypasses the curse and allows Yeshua to be king of Israel. According to Luke's genealogy, Eli died survived by only his daughter, Mary. Numbers 27 to 8 and last week's parasha, Pinkas, inform us of the following. Numbers 27 and 8. You shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, if a man die and have no son, then you shall cause his inheritance to pass through to his daughter. So Mary was entitled by this commandment to receive her father's inheritance. Now this is where our passage in Parashah Masse comes, to, comes into play. Numbers 36, 1 through 9. According to this commandment, Mary could not only keep her inheritance and thus pass it on to her son if she married within her own tribe, had she married outside of her tribe, she would have lost her inheritance and none of her offsprings would have claimed to, to the throne of Israel. As we know, however, from Matthew's genealogy, Joseph and Mary were in fact from the same tribe, the tribe of Judah. Therefore, because of the miraculous virgin birth of Yeshua, Yahweh circumvented the curse placed on the line of Jeconiah, allowing Yeshua to be Melech Israel, the king of Israel. Do we not serve an awesome God? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Do not allow disobedience to lead to demise. Numbers 33 to 136. Doctor, I'm sorry, 33, 1 to 36, 13. Jeremiah 2, 4 to 28, 3 and 4. James 4, 1 through 12. Numbers 35, 33, 50. Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the plains of Moab by Yardan the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Speak to Ben Israel, the children of Israel, and tell them, When you pass over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land before you and destroy all their figured stones and destroy all their molten images and demolish all their high places. Why do Yahweh give the instructions to the children of Israel that they should drive out all the inhabitants of the land of Canaan from before them? It was not because Yahweh does not love the Canaanites, but rather it was because he hated their sin. Sin and righteous cannot cohabitate. One would definitely affect or influence the other. Sadly, because the children of Israel were just human beings made of flesh and blood, their flesh, like ours, would therefore be drawn towards sin, self-satisfaction and self-fulfillment. Also, the way of sin is a much easier path to follow. It provides instant gratification, whereas righteousness requires so much more efforts and its rewards take so much longer to achieve. As an example, it is just so much easier to tell a lie than to have to go into the embarrassing details and tell the truth. However, lying is a sin. God hates sin. So by telling the children of Israel to drive out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan from before them, Yahweh was protecting them from the probability of sinning and giving them a better chance of being righteous. The second thing Yahweh told the children of Israel in its effort to protect and preserve righteousness was that they were to destroy the Canaanite stone idols, destroy all the molten images, and demolish all their high places where they offered sacrifices to their God. God knows our frame. He knows that our flesh cannot resist, especially over the long run. Temptation and therefore will be drawn into sin. If Israel left the inhabitants in the land and allowed their idols and images in high places to remain, then they would inevitably be drawn into the abominations of the Canaanite, and Yahweh would then have to judge them. The third thing Yahweh chose the children of Israel 
was for them to take possession of the land of Canaan. Numbers 33, 53. And you should take possession of the land and dwell therein. For to you have I given the land to possess it. Yahweh gave this land to the children of Israel to possess. How can Yahweh give away a land that someone else is living in? Here's how. Psalms 15, 12. For the world is mine in all its fullness. Exodus 19, 5. For all the earth is mine. Yahweh owns the world, the universe, in fact, and he can give it to whomever he pleases. Amen. I believe that what we're learning here is very significant to every saved believer in Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. Because of how this parasha parallels our life, here's what I mean. Yahweh gave us our salvation. It was a free gift. He chose us. We did not choose him. He commanded us to be separate, say Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, says Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. We are to live separate lives. This means that we need to change the type of people we hang around with. Yeshua witnessed to sinners, but he hung out with his Talmudin, his discipline, disciples. He also, we also need to change the places where we hang out, and we need to change those things that we do that are not according to the word of God. Our land is the kingdom of God. Yahweh gave it to us as salvation. Yet the kingdom of God has not yet taken over the earth, but it has certainly taken over those of us who are called by God. Therefore, we must remove everything from our lives that may cause our flesh to be tempted and thus our bodies to sin. This will involve changing our friendships, changing the way we dress, and changing our manner of speech, just to name a few things. It also involves removing all abominations from our home, that is, anything that does not glorify God, like certain books, records, cassettes, CDs, and videos. If you're married to an unbeliever, however, it does not mean that you have to leave your unsaved spouse and children. 1 Corinthians 7, 14, for the believing husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. <clears throat> we all know that the children of Israel did not obey Yahweh, and this ultimately led to their de demise. Do not allow your disobedience to lead to your demise. Do not allow disobedience to lead to your demise. Shabbat shalom. It's Torah portion and half Torah portion is, I mean, full. Okay, it's full today. I could, you know, teach uh, hours, okay, on any portion, okay, of it. Um, I want to go back over the half Torah portion, starting in Jeremiah chapter 1. So if you'll turn in your Bible or Tanakh to Jeremiah uh, chapter 1. And I have to keep a few... Get a few extra Tanakhs, I think, so that you can uh, um, have them to your access. I don't know if any are over, are over there. Are there any Tanakhs over there? Okay. I know there's one over here, too. All right. Yeah, on the bottom there. I think that's it. Okay. All right. There may even be extra at times the keyword study Bible. So when we have someone come in, okay, if they can, you know, get a copy, if, that, uh, there, if there's an extra keyword study Bible over there so that when we use that, um, we have it. All right. One of the things I love about our uh, uh, version of the uh, Tanakh, the Jewish study Bible, is that I encourage you to read the write-ups, the commentary is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. Okay, a couple of things about uh, Jeremiah. Okay, it tells who he is. The first uh, uh, verse tells who he is. And he's one of the priests at Anathoth, okay, in the territory of Benjamin. That may not mean a lot to you unless you really study the Bible to find out that Anathoth, okay, is where, if you remember during the... I'll say challenge David had with Absalom and all that kind of stuff and how there were two sets of priests. There was one set of priests that followed David, the Zadok priesthood, the other ones that were for Saul and for Absalom and all that. Abiathar was one of the names. So we know that uh, Jeremiah was part of the priesthood that had been exiled. Okay, he had been exiled. He was not one of the Zadok priests. 
okay, because he's in Anathoth there. Uh, we see him from the days of Josiah all the way out through uh, King Jehoiakim, which means that he had been prophesying for quite a while, at least 40 or more, okay, years. So that means he was there prior to, once again, them uh, being exiled. And then he also saw the exile. He experienced, okay, Nebuchadnezzar coming himself. That's important for you to understand. All right, Jeremiah preached destruction and also saw it. Always remember the word of God is a pattern for things to come. All right, and you need to understand that. He preached destruction and he saw destruction. In other words, he preached what it was God said he was going to do with the people and he saw God do with the same people that he was preaching to also with whom he said he was preaching about. Jeremiah saw all of that. So Jeremiah technically was a witness. You see, we will see certain things with our own eyes. It's important to understand that because Yeshua talks about, okay, in Matthew chapter 24, about a fig tree, when the fig tree blossoms, okay, and all of that. And we know that he, what he says is the generation that sees that fig tree will be the generation that sees the coming of the Lord. All right. So it's important to understand. He says, those that see these things begin will see them to completion. All right. So that was a message that was understood. How many things do we read in the Bible that we really just don't understand because we are so divorced from the culture? All right. That's like even with it, we're going uh, on there, but um, I let uh, Leroy, Leroy, I wanted you to read that about the genealogies because there are some times when people may come against you with who Yeshua is. You understand what I'm saying? So you need to fully understand how he inherits the throne. You need to understand why Matthew does what he does with the genealogies, as well as why Luke did what he did with the genealogies. The theme behind Matthew is showing Yeshua as the king, the king, you understand? Okay, important to understand because whoever is going to be Messiah has to be linked to that throne. Okay, not only just linked to the throne, but the proper lineage through the throne. As opposed to Luke's genealogy, he winds up all the way at Adam because he's showing, and remember, I want you to think about this. Matthew is a Jew kingship. Luke is a proselyte Gentile. So it is natural for Luke to go all the way back to Adam. You understand? To show Yeshua linked to Adam. OK, maybe because some people were thinking he just zapped here with the force or whatsoever. OK, it's important that you are able to link him to Adam because it was Adam that was given orig the original set of keys to the kingdom. You understand what I'm saying? He is the original key holder. OK, he is the original one who God called king. All right, so it's important to understand how Yeshua ties to Adam in fulfillment of the prophecies that were given to Adam and Eve. So if you can't link him there, you now have a legal argument saying he does not qualify. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible is very a very legal book to show you how certain things can happen because whatever you bind on earth must be bound in heaven. It must meet up in both realms. You understand what I'm saying? So that's why those genealogies are important, but even more more important is the fact that we have that in the Torah to tell us why, okay, things can occur the way that they do. You understand what I'm saying? So those articles, and the reason I give them to you also is to encourage you to share them with people, to keep them. Don't throw them out because trust me when I say you are going to need that. You're going to need to go over and refresh that. If you do not know and still don't understand, memorize it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you know, because if you don't know who he is, whom do men say that I am? You understand what I'm saying? You need to be able to explain to other people who, how, what, why, and everything, okay, with that. And that puts it in a form that is very non-threatening, 
Okay, very non-threatening. But it's because of your knowledge of the Torah. But if you don't know how to apply the Torah, it means nothing. Everything that we are doing here is so that you know how to apply the Torah to your everyday life. You know, so that there is no incontinuity between Genesis all the way to Revelation. All right. There's only one God. He is the same today, yesterday and forever. This is why I get on people when they start saying that, well, that was done away with. Hold on. That means he's not the same today as he was yesterday, because when he says forever, he means forever. You have to show how he fulfills everything within this word of God. And to say that he has canceled things that he himself out of his mouth has not canceled, that means you're lying on God. Okay, and there's a problem with that. That's why there's so many different denominations because everybody chooses what part of the Bible they want to obey and what part they're choosing not to obey. All right, so the problem with that. Now, we talked about Jeremiah. Jeremiah preached destruction and he also saw it. Jeremiah saw in his own days the word of Yahweh fulfilled in his life. All right. Now, I want you to think about it. Uh, Ezekiel, we talked about Ezekiel on Thursday. He experienced the captivity. You see, so he was a witness there. He experienced the captivity. Now, something that uh, the Lord was dealing with me with this morning is that Yahweh places his prophets in his word. So something you need to understand about his word is that his word is a space of time. When you get this, his word is a space of time and it is also a place in time. The word is a space in time and it is also a place in time because we're seeing the prophets do what? Hear the word and experience the word. We're seeing all through 40 years, a place in time and a physical place, space in time, place in time. You understand? All right. So it's important to understand that place in time. It is a physical. His word is also a physical space in time and a physical place in time. You see that it's important to understand on earth as it is in heaven. We see that even with Daniel, when Daniel is fasting for 20 one days and he comes and Gabriel finally gets down saying, oh, man, I've been going through. <laughs> okay, you know, from the first moment you set your heart, that means 20 days and 23 hours and 58 minutes ago, I was sent to you. Okay, but you had to wait this time because of the battle that was going on in the heavens. You understand? Sometimes when you pray, once again, understand things may be delayed, not because of you, but because once again, the enemy always knows the purpose and how it is going to affect his kingdom when you pray. God answers that prayer right away. Guess what? And you're no longer in poverty. Then he can't harass you about certain things. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so always understand that God's word is a space in time and a place in time. It is a physical space and it is a physical place. All right, so when we go, one of the most beautiful things that I love about Jeremiah chapter one is when he says in verse five, and I'm reading from the Tanakh, before I created you in the womb, I selected you. You know what that means? Before you were even a thought, a drop in your mother's mind, he already had a purpose for you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. You know, people waiting around for us, some man to pour oil and lay hands and all that. Okay. But one thing to understand about a prophet, man does not lay hands on prophets and determine they are prophets. It is Yah himself that anoints a prophet. Okay, you can anoint a priest. Man anoints a king. Man may anoint a apostle, but God calls that person into the 
okay, apostolic ministry, but it is Yahweh himself that anoints the prophet. The spirit of Adonai Yahweh is upon me because Yahweh has anointed me. You understand in um, Isaiah chapter 61. So he lets Jeremiah know from before you are even a thought in your mother's mind, I had already ordained a purpose for you. I want you to think about that. You're trying to find what your purpose is. God had a purpose for each of us before we were born. And guess what? Every single thing you have gone through brought you to this room today. How many times? Well, if I could have changed this, if I could have could have. How many times do we not understand? If we had done that, you might not be here listening you might not have been brought into the door i'm not willing to risk that do you understand what i'm saying i'm not willing to risk that certain things that i couldn't could have changed mean i wouldn't have my children i'm not willing to risk that you understand what i'm saying so when i understand that every single experience that god himself brought me through whether it was my doing okay he had a purpose for me and what he has taught me over the years that do you honestly think I'm going to allow anything in two legs stop you from being doing what I ordained you to do before I formed you in the belly? Oh, come on now. Come on now. When you understand that, stop living in the past. Move forward. God, in some cases, will not even let you mess it up. Okay. <laughs> he won't let you mess it up. Okay. So, because what does he say? Jeremiah, here we go with the excuses. Oh, God, I'm a boy. Oh, I got this kid. Oh, I got this. Oh, excuses. Okay. God didn't pay no attention to him. Don't say that but just go wherever I send you and speak whatever I command you, okay? Don't have any fear of them. How many times are we afraid to go into a place? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Yeah, if you are going in your own strength and with your own mindset, you don't. There are times when you have to, oh, when you are working for God, you have to overcome that fear. It doesn't mean not to be fearful because we're human. You go in and you see a bunch of hungry lions, Daniel. <laughs> okay. I understand why you may have a little trepidation about going <laughs> into, <laughs> into that cave. But if you know God has given you a purpose, God has given you a purpose. Those lions are not my problem. They are God's because he gave me a word that he needs for me to say to somebody. And I haven't met them yet. You understand what I'm saying? You have to understand that. Okay. So he says, have no fear of them, for I am with you to deliver you. See, if your revelation of God is based upon what man says he is, you will have a problem. Because go up and down the street, you will have a hundred different revelations of who God is. That's why you've got to get to the point where he's a personal, where you have a personal relationship with him. Okay. Because you may go through the lake of fire. I'm not going to say hell. Okay. But let me tell you, and I'll say hell because how many times have we felt like literally we were dying? How many times have we thought we saw, okay, just like with that accident, the gates of hell would have passed by you and the enemy would have said, that's it. But God has a purpose. You understand the purpose that he ordained for you, sister, before he formed you in the belly. You understand? Okay. Going to the next page, uh, verse number nine. So Yahweh touches his mouth. Okay. And I'm going to put my words in your mouth. Okay. I appoint you this day, this day. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah one verse 10 is a what place in time, a space in time. Okay. So this day I appoint you over what nations and kingdoms understand something. We have come to counsel Kings. Sometimes people don't understand you because the message you're trying to convey is not for them. 
<laughs> it's not for them. If you're not a king, how are you going to understand king talk? <laughs> oh, come on. You won't understand it. Oh, look at them. They're trying to be above. No. Oh, oh, oh. I forgot. You're the wrong audience. Let me go on and get out of here and leave you in your ignorance alone. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? Sometimes the message you have that you feel that audience needs is not the audience God gave you the message for. All right. And that's why he says, I'm giving you a specific purpose. Why? Over nations and kingdoms. Nations. Remember what Yeshua said. There would be wars with what? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We know that nation, once again, ethnic groups. There are certain, in other words, I'm sending you to certain groups of people and to certain, what we call a nation is really a kingdom, okay, in the Bible. To do what? Oh, they're going to love you. You're going to prophesy they're all going to get new cars and houses and the single women are going to get married and, and people are going to get a girlfriend, okay? <laughs> How many times have you gone to a, you heard Prophet Hobo Jones was going to be there and the only thing you left with was an empty wallet? <laughs> okay. But he says, when I send you there, you are going to uproot and pull down. That doesn't mean sound, sound like real pleasant message. Uproot, pull down, destroy, overflow, build, and to plant. All right, did you notice the order he put that in? Before you plant, there may be some things you have to uproot and pull down. There are some things you may have to destroy and overcome. We too often trying to plant seed in soil that has not been prepared to receive the seed. You understand what I'm saying? You know, I may have to punch you in the face and then give you CPR. Okay, and then when you wake up, okay, we can talk. You'll be in condition, okay, to hear what it is I have to say, all right? In other words, what when, when he's talking about uprooting, pulling down, destroying, and overthrowing, he's not coming to say, I'm giving you a nice message for these people to hear because right now they are in no condition to receive anything I have for them, Jeremiah. So before they can receive it, you've got to destroy everything that they are doing right now to prepare. That's not pleasant. That means right from the start, he knew wherever he went, they were going to hate him because he was not going to let them live by status quo. You understand what I'm saying? That's what time it is right now. People don't want to see you if you have a message of truth. Okay. And that's whether it is the secular or whether it is the church too. Okay. Then he goes to him and I like verse 11. The word of Yahweh came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch of an almond tree. Oh, if you were in the church, I see so many different saints. And how many times do we spiritualize? We look at something and we spiritualize. I look at that plant and all that white. Those are the saints in white before God. And you know, and that vessel that they are in is the church and everybody's, oh wow, she's so spiritual. <laughs> Come on, what do you see that? Um, I think you need to get the broom and dust that off of your wall, <laughs> okay? All right, no, Jeremiah said, I see a branch of an almond tree because what was it? It was a branch of the almond tree. Okay. <laughs> you understand? If you cannot say it the way it exactly is, then you will not only go off into realms of deception, you will lead other people into realms of deception because you will lead them to believe they are not seeing something exactly the way it is. Hello, hello, hello. We are there. We see stuff happen and people make excuses for why it's supposed to be that way. You understand what I'm saying? It stinks. Okay. All right. So he goes on then. I see a branch of an almond tree. Yahweh said to me, you have seen right. Now the King James says, I am 
hastening my word to bring it to pass. See, this is why sometimes we do need, okay, to look at it from the Hebrew perspective. He says, I am watchful to bring my word to pass. What does that mean? This is where, once again, we study the Bible, what biblically, culturally, historically, and times linguistically. We look at the very words that he is speaking. Now, see, if we had the student uh, uh, Bible, I would take you over to that word for almond tree and over to that word for watchful, and you would find out they have the same three letters. So what he is doing is actually playing upon those words. Each of them has exactly the same root. Okay, almond is shaked. Okay, and watchful, once again, is shachad. Same exact word, all right? Same exact root, but with a vowels. The vowels are different with them. But the whole point is also is why the almond tree. The almond tree, and this is where I say, you study different things. If he uses something symbolically, study the nature of that so you will understand why he used that particular symbol. And in understanding that, the almond tree is the first tree to flower in Israel. It's the first tree to bloom, which means it is the beginning of spring. It's a harbinger. Hello. We've heard that term before. It is a harbinger of spring. So when the almond tree blooms, it's saying, I'm watching for spring. It's time for me to bloom. Hey, everybody, spring is here. So then he says, I see an almond tree, and Yahweh responds to him, I, once again, same root, am watching over my word. Okay, so just as, once again, almond tree watches over spring to tell you that spring is coming, Yahweh watches over his word to fulfill it. You understand? He gives them that example. You don't understand that because we're not, we're looking at, looking at it in someone else's language. Now, we went from King James Version, okay, to the Hebrew here. I will hasten my word to perform it. Hasten to you means quick, quick, quick. Okay, so watching over it to perform it, that kind of has a different meaning depending upon who you are talking to. So just as the almond tree watches over the spring to tell you it is coming, I'm watching over my word to tell you I'm going to fulfill it. You understand what I'm saying? So one of the things you do now, you have the understanding of an almond tree. So what should you do? Look through the scriptures for almond tree. Oh, I remember. Didn't we just have an almond branch with the... Uh, um, Okay, with Aaron and everything. We saw it blossomed, it brought forth buds, it brought forth fruit. Okay, God used that, and we talked about that. He used the natural occurrence to perform a miracle. Okay, a miracle with that. All right, so almond tree watches for spring. Okay, and hastens to enter it. Yahweh watches over his word to fulfill it. And what he means is, I'm not going to waste time doing what I'm telling you I'm going to do. That was the uh, Charlotte Israel version of that verse. <laughs> okay. And then he goes on to, to him to say, a second time, what do you see? I see a steaming pot. Oh, I see souls in turmoil. Ha! All right. <laughs> Come on now. No, it's a pot steaming. It's boiling. <laughs> and Yahweh said to me, now he says, I see a temp steaming pot tipped away from the north. So he was very specific in what it was he said. See, sometimes God can't show you something. You don't have to necessarily at that point spiritualize it. Just look at it. There's something that God wants me to see in this. So what is it that I am looking at? What is the real thing I am looking at? He's giving me an object lesson that he is going to teach me a spiritual application. 
But too often we take that object lesson and we spiritualize it and then have somebody confirm whether we are right. No, God confirms his word. You understand what I'm saying? God confirms his word. So I see a steaming pot, boiling pot, and it's tipped away from the north. Yahweh said to me, from the north shall disaster break loose upon the inhabitants of the land, for I am summoning all the peoples of the kingdom of the north, declares Yahweh. Okay, so once again, that boiling pot, he explains there's calamity about to happen. There's trouble that is being stirred up. And where it is coming from, it's going to come from the north. Now, understand something. Okay, we have Assyria. Let's look at Israel's enemies. This is why it's important to study history. Okay, with the northern kingdom, remember the northern kingdom was taken over by Assyria. We know all through the Bible that the Syrians were harassers of Israel and they were from the north. In the Bible, the Syrians are also called the Arameans. So it's important to understand that trouble from Israel in the Bible very often came from Syria. Where are we today? Trouble for Israel is coming from exactly the same areas as it was that Yah said in the book of Jeremiah. You understand what I'm saying? And it's boiling, okay? It's beginning to get hotter. Things are beginning to stir up and everything. You understand what I'm saying? By the time of Jeremiah, though, Babylon had conquered Syria, Armenia, and all of that. Oh, yeah, Syria and Assyria, okay, also. So even though Babylon was to the east, they were going to come from the north. So he understood, okay. You know what is amazing? how people in the Bible understood and how people today read the Bible don't understand. You understand what I'm saying? When you don't understand, you can come up with something that is so foreign, okay, from what the Bible means. That's why it's important to understand what the Bible means from the perspective of those who were living it and those who wrote it. So you should be able to look at that historically also to see that everything that Jeremiah wrote here that Yah said he was going to do, you can see it at a point in history that it was done. You understand? So when you study the Bible biblically and historically, that even more should reinforce your faith. You understand what I'm saying? That God means what he says and he says what he means. Now, he writes it in the Bible for those who would believe. He writes it in history. Okay, he puts it in that encyclopedia. Encyclopedia is not, okay, a religious document. So that written word serves as a witness whether you are his or whether you aren't. And there is no, there is continuity in both versions of it. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, so then uh, um, once again, you know, we know what's going to happen. And they would have understood that it uh, meant that they were coming. Um, once again, uh, by Babylon. What is he saying here also? He goes on to say in verse number 15, I'm summoning all the peoples of the kingdoms of the north. All right. And uh, declare, Yahweh, they shall come and each set up a throne where? Before the gates of Jerusalem. Didn't we just learn about gates? So in other words, what, I'm, what he's saying, remember, the gates were places where the leaders of that city would come and sit and they would pass judgment. In other words, from the north, I'm bringing people that are going to not only judge you, but pass judgment against everything going on in this particular place. So it was a very clear message to the prophet about what God was going to do, who he was going to do it through, where he was going to do it at, why he was doing it, and whom it was going to be done on. You understand? That's how God talks to his people. You should not accept any less than that. All right? That's why I say you can ask those questions. 
who, what, where, when, why, how, how much. And God will answer those questions. Someone comes to you with a prophecy, okay, and it doesn't answer those questions, you have a right to question. You have a right. Well, go back. And ask that same voice, okay, that if this message is for me, I know what I ask God. So if you are giving me a message from him, the message you bring should be in response to something I know I ask. Instead, no, you hear Prophet Hobo Jones and you just, ah, ah, whatever the prophet said, you fall out in. Okay, and then uh, a couple days later, when you go to look for that $50, you remember, oh, I put it in the prophet's hand. <laughs> okay, <laughs> as he drives by with his new car, waving at you on the bus stop, okay? Come on, come on, yeah, I'm talking real here, okay? All right, the rest of that is once again how, okay, uh, he um, explains everything that is going to happen. I want to go to the... Torah portion now. Okay. Now, something to think about. I'll give you some things to think about. Okay, today. Who was the first redeemer of Israel? Moses. Moses. Moses, the first redeemer who redeemed Israel from slavery physically. Okay, Moses redeemed, okay, Yahweh we know ultimately is redeemer, but who was his agent that he used on earth as it is in heaven? You better make sure whatever you're following on earth has that heavenly authority to go behind it. You understand what I'm saying? So Moses is who he used in the physical to redeem his people. Of course, he had already declared them to be that he was going to redeem them. But he used a physical per person as an agent through which that redemption would come. You understand what I'm saying? So Moses, as the first redeemer, redeemed the people from slavery physically, but unfortunately, he was never able to redeem them spiritually. You see what I'm saying? But guess what? That was not his purpose. It was not his purpose. So this is where you need to understand Yeshua. Yeshua came to, and we say, redeem the people spiritually, right? But we leave it there, don't we? Don't we leave it there? That's not his full purpose. His purpose, once again, is to be, a, and when it says a prophet like unto Moses, if Moses came to redeem the people physically, one of the roles of Yeshua will also be a physical redemption as well as a spiritual redemption. You understand what I'm saying? The book of Revelation reveals him in that physical redemption. The gospels and the epistles reveal the spiritual redemption. You understand? The church just leaves it there. It leaves it out there, not understanding that in the I'll say Tanakh, he reveals, I'm not just going to call you out of Egypt the way I did before. I'm going to call you out of every single nation that I have scattered you. I'm going to redeem you out of every nation and bring you here. Now, understand something. He's going to redeem and gather all the descendants of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob from all the nations that he has cast them out, and restore them to the land of Israel. Now, let me say something. You have, oh God, this was messing me up today. You have a place of birth, and you have a home. Very often, the home is not your place of birth. Am I right? Okay. How many times do we call the place of birth our home? Okay, it's where we were born, but you have a place of birth and you have a home. Israel is your home. Israel is your home if you're an Israelite. Why? 
because you make a home with your husband. And he takes you from your place of birth and brings you to the home he has prepared for you. And you're supposed to call that place home home because you are dwelling there with him. You understand what I'm get feel what I'm saying. You need to feel what it is I'm saying. Okay. Israel is what you have rights to when as the bride of Messiah. Oh, come on now. You understand what I'm saying? This may be your physical home or place of birth and where you are temporarily dwelling, but your home is Israel. We are heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. Okay. So we have a right in Israel, not only because of what this says here, but what the word says. In Ezekiel, the end of Ezekiel, it talks about the stranger that chooses to dwell with you. Give them an equal house as yours, an equal place with yours. It's important for you to understand that because where there is no understanding, okay, the enemy can abuse. The enemy will try to tell you, you don't deserve a place in Israel, you lying demon. Israel is my home because Yeshua is my husband and I intend to go dwell where he does. You understand what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with having a summer house too. <laughs> So we can consider wherever you are now your summer house, okay? But Israel is your home, okay? Get that in your mind, your home. Okay, now, so we've established that, okay, with him, where he's going to bring us from. That's why I say, if you don't know who he is and the different roles and relationships he's supposed to have in your life, people can tell you anything. Whom do you say that I am? If you are married, okay, Grace, nobody can, uh, not Grace, uh, Miriam, nobody can tell you Andy is not your husband. You would think they bumped their head because you know you've been with him how long? Andy, are you my husband? What? <laughs> All these years? Okay. Okay. So no one can tell you that because you have a relationship a long lasting relationship. That's why I cannot understand these people that renounce Yeshua, that come into Hebrew roots and renounce Yeshua. I can't understand it because you're telling me you didn't have no intimate relationship. You had a now you had who man said that he is because now you're accepting him because of man who man says he is, which is why we teach you look at these genealogies so that you know for yourself. You understand what I'm saying? Look at this Torah so that you know this for yourself. We came into Torah already with a relationship. But some I'm knowing came into Torah and didn't have a relationship. They had a man's relationship with God and not a God relationship with God. You understand what I'm saying? All right. So how do people who say they have the Holy Spirit renounce Yeshua and then go into Orthodox Judaism or something else? How does that happen? Maybe you didn't have the Holy Spirit. And people get upset with me. Well, how are you going to say the Holy Spirit said, I will never leave you or, or forsake you. So what do you do? You have them locked up in the basement somewhere <laughs> in chains. Okay. What's that rattling I hear when I get next to you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's go to Numbers 35 for a moment. I'm not going to keep you too much longer. Smidgets, smidgets here. I have to give it to you the way I get it, okay? Sometimes the Lord will jump all over the place with me. He'll show me something. Then he begins leading me down a different path to get understanding. Then guess what? He begins to tie all the dots together. You understand? All right? Today's title, Whom Do Men Say That I Am? Okay? Or Who Do You Say That I Am? Who Do You Say That I Am? That's the title. All right? Because whoever you say he is to you is who he will be. You understand what I'm saying? Whoever you say he is to you is who he will be. Okay. That's why it's important to have relationship. Have you ever been healed? 
then to you, he is a healer. Has he ever answered a prayer for you? Then to you, he is the one that answers prayer. Have you ever been sad and then something happens and you get joy? Then he is to you, he is the one that brings you joy. Okay? If you've ever been in turmoil and then all of a sudden I feel peace, then he is the one who brings that peace in the midst of the storm. Who do you say that he is? Who is he to you? You understand? Just because he's that to you, he may be something to someone else, something different. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to try to take that away from anybody. You understand what I'm saying? You know, to a baby who is hungry, any woman can offer to nurse that child. It does not mean that that one nursing is the mother. We've seen that too often, right? You understand what I'm saying? That child has a need that that one can supply. But as the child gets older, it learns who its mother is. And that relationship is established. Okay. So there can be a physical mother, even though there may be someone else fulfilling the role of mother. But the one fulfilling the role of mother technically is not the mother. You understand? And some people may have a better relationship with the one fulfilling the role than the mother. You have kids that have a better relationship with grandparents than they do their actual parents. You understand? Because that grandparent has been raising them all that time. Okay. It's all about relationship. Okay. Who do you say he is? We're going to talk about in numbers 35. And I was kind of excited to uh, um, get an understanding on this. Numbers 35, it talks about the blood, the kinsman redeemer. Can we all agree if you read that? That's why it's important for you to read the Torah portions prior to coming to class. Here's one reason. One plows, another plants, another waters. I don't like to do the plowing, guys. <laughs> Okay, don't like to do the plowing because you plow before you put the seed in. I'm here to bring the seed and then allow Yah to water and bring forth the harvest. So when you don't study the Torah portion before you come to class, then that person is plowing. And guess what? That's why some people never get an understanding because that's why the birds of the field can come along very easily and pluck up that because the ground was not prepared to receive the seed. You understand? It's just laying right on top there, making it, you know, bird come by and say, oh, buffet. Okay. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So it's important for you to read the Torah portion, even read the handouts before you get here. Because when sometimes when you hear someone say something in a different voice, you get understanding. They're reading the same words. Oh, all of a sudden I get understanding. Why? Because you had already plowed and now you were ready to receive understanding. You understand? Okay, so it's important. There are times when you read, okay, those handouts, that is the plowing. Leroy, Ed, get up. That is the planting of seed. I give up to get up to give an explanation. That's the water. And then you walk out here and Yah brings the increase. You understand what I'm saying? So if you follow that pattern with the services all the time, you're going to begin to get so much more. Okay, so much more out of it. That's why I'm trying to get it to you earlier. Okay, then, you know, three o'clock in the morning. All right. <laughs> All right. I recognize that, you know, so uh, I'm trying to get it to you. I'm trying to get better. Okay. Trying to get better. All right. So anyway, chapter 35 begins with them telling them to give towns. Okay. Places. All right. To a portion. Uh, he starts with, uh, let's start reading. Yahweh spoke to Moses in the steps of Moab. Remember I said his word is what? A space in time, a place in time, both physically and spiritually. So we're in Numbers 35, verse 1. At the Jordan near Jericho, where are they positioned? Okay, they, they are positioned to do what? Conquer. They're positioned, he put them in place. He's giving them the last instructions, okay, at this point. They are facing Jericho, and they are sitting over, over there in Jericho. 
Jericho. We know then he goes through Deuteronomy. Okay, Deuteronomy takes about 30 days to do. Then Moses dies, right? Then there's another 30 day of, mo of mourning. They still haven't moved. So they are in exactly the same place for probably about 60 days. You understand? Okay, that's why we need to be patient. Okay, because if we sit for more than 10 minutes, oh, I'm bored. Oh, I'm this. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? And you can miss God. Now, there was a psychological value to that too. And we know that from the book of Joshua, because all these millions of people are right where Jericho can see them. Jericho knows what's about to go down. They just don't know when. So can you imagine the traumatic stress that every time they wake up, millions of people are there that they know are going to conquer them. Nine times out of 10, let me tell you, a whole lot of people were packing up and leaving already. <laughs> I know what's going down here. I, def I, I am not, not going to defend this. You can have it. God said you, it was yours. Bye. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? So the psychological, and we know that what did uh, Rahab tell them? Man, don't you understand our hearts were failing with fear? Our hearts failing with fear. Okay, those that wound up staying in Jericho probably were those that had no fear of God. You understand what I'm saying? Because anybody with good sense seeing all them people, okay, over there, and guess what? There was a wall that was designed to keep people coming from another land into another land out, but the wall didn't stop them. You understand what I'm saying? God took that wall down. OK, so when God says, yes, I don't care what you try to build up against him. Nine times out of 10, that wall was built during that 40 years. That they should have been over there. So people in their arrogance thought they were going to, OK, build a wall to keep God from being able to do what he had said. You see the arrogance of that? That's one reason. Another reason why they were probably first for your arrogance. OK. So anyway, uh, um, let me see. Verse two, instruct the Israelite people. I'm going to go to about quarter after today. To assign out of the holdings a portion for them towns for the Levites to dwell in. You shall also assign to the Levites pasture land around their towns. The town shall be theirs to dwell in and the pasture shall be for the cattle they own and all other beasts. Hello, what did you just learn there? That even though the Levites did not have apportionment from God, he instructed all of Israel to make apportions for them within their territories. Why? Because they needed a place to dwell. They needed pasture for the cattle they own. They own, they weren't poor. We got to get out of this, all these poor people. And poor you'll have with you always. But they were not the majority. They were not meant, God's people were not meant to be the majority of the poor. Poverty was meant to be a temporary, a temporary condition for maybe disobedience or whatever a season you were going through. We took it as that's our way of life. Okay. That's never, never God's intention. Okay. He goes on to give them, okay. He gives them direct dimensions. He tells them what he wants them to do, where he wants them to do it, how he wants it done. You understand what I'm saying? Ask God the questions. Start asking God the questions because when you read this, he'll tell you, this is what I want you to do. This is who I want you to do it with. This is how I want you to do it. This is why I want you to do it. You understand what I'm saying? You get very clear answers. So when you pray, you should get very clear explanation because I'm asking the same God that was speaking right here, okay? All right. Um, then in verse six, he says, you shall assign to the Levites. OK, six cities of refuge that you are to designate for a manslayer to flee to, to which you shall add 42 towns. Now, something with that manslayer, because there is a commandment that says thou shalt not murder. Right. Or thou shalt not kill. OK, we call it kill. So why is Yahweh providing 
a place for someone who's killed someone. If the commandment means thou shalt not kill anybody. So obviously that word kill doesn't mean the same thing in the English as it did in the Hebrew. I'm not going to go through all of, all of that right now. Okay. It's more murder, deliberate murder of which there is a death sentence. Then there are certain times when just like in the law, you have first degree, second degree manslaughter as opposed to murder, first degree murder. Okay. So let's go. So he says there's going to be a town for these particular people. Verse nine. Yahweh spoke further to Moses, speak to the Israelite people and say to them, when you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, remember place and time, space of time, who, what, where, when, how, why, and how, and how much. Okay. So he's giving them, when you do this, you shall provide yourself with places to serve as cities of refuge to which a manslayer who has killed a person, how unintentionally shall may flee. The city shall serve you as a refuge from the avenger. So he's telling you there, there may be times when an accident may happen, but someone of that other family may try to avenge their death because what is it? Eye for eye, hand for hand, life for life. Okay? so that the manslayer may not die unless he has stood trial before the assembly. All right. The town that you thus assign shall be six cities, blah, 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 blah. Okay. With that verse 15, these six cities shall serve the Israelites and the resident aliens among them for refuge. So that anyone who kills a person unintentionally may flee there. Now, he goes on to clarify that anyone, however, who strikes another man with an iron object so that death results is a murderer. In other words, you knew when you hit them with that iron, you were, your intention was to kill that person. Your intention. This is no accident. Your intention. So can we look and see how our law today is kind of formed? Okay. After this law, the murderer must be put to death. So you have all of these people marching against the death penalty because the commandment says thou shalt not kill. That's not what it says. Mm -hmm. However, I'm sorry, we have a very corrupt legal system. There are people who are sitting on death row who did not do the crime. Okay, that did not do the crime. Okay, and there are people who have been executed who were later found guilty and uh, rather not guilty and exonerated kind of late now. You understand what I'm saying? Because our... Sur our system is corrupt is basically one of the reasons we should get rid of the death penalty because we have corrupt judges. We have corrupt, not all are. Okay. I'm not against the legal system. I'm against it being used improperly. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So if he struck him with a stone tool that could cause death, death resulted, he is a murderer. In other words, the weapon you are using is going to determine. If I take a Uzi pointed at you and pull the trigger, I definitely, by the weapon I chose, intended on you not living. So it is what? Intent. It's important for you to understand. There are certain things that may not be a crime unless they can prove, prove the intent behind what it was you were doing. You understand what I'm saying? All right. That is the whole key behind everything that we see going on with certain investigations right now. What was the intention? And when you open your mouth and run your mouth, okay, you don't have to prove, they don't have to look too far. All they got to do is replay the video because you revealed your intention. Okay. If you have the opportunity to do this, this is what I intend to do. You can't come back and say you didn't mean it. Sorry, because we see what you're doing and then what you're doing winds up with the intention. So if you can improve intent behind something. Now it's different if you are fearful for your life, somebody's coming against you with a knife, you pick up something to defend yourself, then that also must be proven. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So anyway, put to death, verse 18. Similarly, if the object with the struck him was a wooden tool that would cause death and death resulted, he is a murderer. A murderer must be put to death. The blood avenger himself shall put the murderer to death. So in other words, when you see people at, you know, they're getting ready to uh, do the injections, they very often have who? The family lethal injection. 
They'll have the family, some friends there because they have the right to see justice. Justice. Okay. That's why God did what he did with the Israelites. Egyptians, you threw them babies there in the, in the river. The Israelites had a right to justice. You understand what I'm saying? Ooh, get fearful, guys. Ooh, we need to be fearful. How much blood has been shed? How much blood has been shed on this land that what cries out to God? And the Avengers, do you understand? The Avengers of that blood are the descendants of the ones whom the blood was shed. The recipients of those rewards are the descendants of the ones who shed the blood. Hey, so you did not have to physically do it yourself. I did not have to physically experience it myself. But if my descendants experienced it and say your descendants were the ones who did it, that's how that operates. Oh, we got problems over here. You understand what I'm saying? We have definite problems over here. Okay. So he goes on. It is, okay, he who shall put him to death upon encounter. So too, if he pushed him in hate or hurled something at him on purpose and death occurred, or if he struck him with his hand in enmity and death resulted, the assailant shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The blood avenger shall put the murderer to death upon encounter. So you need to identify who the blood avenger is. I want you to keep that term, blood avenger. The blood avenger has right to enact justice against the one who purposely did the crime. The blood avenger has the right to enact justice against the one who did the crime. You need to determine who's a blood avenger, who's the one that did the crime. We have physical, we have spiritual also. Okay? Yeshua is a blood avenger. Technically, who is he the blood avenger for? Who's Yeshua the blood avenger for? You think so? Go back a little further. Go back a little further. Go back a little further. Adam, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. In the image of God made he them. Okay, Yeshua, okay, was a prototype, remember? Flesh. Okay, come on. So we remember Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. Yeshua made in the image of God. After sin, we're made in Adam's image. Okay, but... Yeshua, once again, once we get saved, what are we doing? We're being conformed and transformed into that very image, which is why he can be our kinsman redeemer as we do what? Submit to God, allow ourselves to be transformed and conformed into his very image. But he is the original redeemer, kinsman redeemer for Adam and Eve, which is why they were the first Adam. He is the a second or last Adam. It's important you know all of this, okay? Because when he comes back, now, he already, once again, has passed judgment against Hasatan. You understand what I'm saying? That's already done. Now, when he comes back, and you see him coming back in the book of Revelation, he's coming back as the blood avenger. You've already been redeemed. Stop looking for Mary's little lamb. He's not coming back as Mary's little lamb. He's coming back as a lying, roaring, rending prey, taking vengeance uh, for every single wrong that has been done to his people, every single wrong done to his disciples, every single wrong, and his people, I mean, all that would become believers. Whether you were of the seed of Jacob directly, or whether you were one who would come into faith in a mixed multitude who would become believers. Every single drop 
of blood that has been shed. We have a redeemer that is coming to not only avenge that, he's coming back as the blood avenger. And guess what? We're going to ride with him. Dead in Christ rise first. Then that alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. And when you see him, okay, in that Revelation 19, with that crowd, okay, we will be there to what? See the reward of the wicked with our very own eyes. You understand what I'm saying? It's important. To, who do you say that he is? I know him both as a redeemer, but I also know he's coming as a blood avenger. That's why vengeance is his. I don't have to enact vengeance. I have to be a witness to see because when he comes back, I'm going to know why. When he does the what, I'm going to know the why behind he's doing the what. I'm going to know the why behind the who. You understand what I'm saying? I know the how he's going to do, why, what, who, and where. You understand what I'm saying? It's important to know him as a kinsman redeemer, but also as a blood avenger. So Messiah is not only going to redeem Israel out of every lamb, he is going to avenge them. He is going to avenge every Jew that was burned in, okay, okay, burned in, okay, those uh, uh, ovens. He is going to redeem everyone who believed in him, who died on that, Atlantic crossing. He especially, you know what is so fearful to me? You know why I'm so afraid for America with slavery? Because I was hearing today someone historically how slave owners would pay pastors. They would pay pastors to come in and preach the Bible to their slaves using scriptures, using the word of God, okay, to validate why they had to be good slaves. They would pay pastors to do that. And guess what? We are seeing it again today. You understand what I'm saying? But guess what? I know a blood avenger. I know a blood avenger. And I am fearful. I am fearful. I am fearful. Okay, not too joyful. Okay, well, part of me is kind of mean. Okay, get him, get him, get him, get him. Okay, but the other part is, guess what? A boiling pot that is getting ready to tip over. You understand what I'm saying? And I understand when I heard, I was studying the almond tree, and I hear my spirit in Washington, it's the cherry. When the cherry trees bloom, when is it? Spring. They're a harbinger. Huh? Cherry blossom. So Yah was saying, I have harbingers all over the world. If you were to study the first blooming tree, you understand what I'm saying? It may over there, it was the almond tree. Over here, it is a cherry tree. Over there, it may be something else. You understand? That lets you know. Okay. Yah will give you an example based upon what it is your understanding is. He didn't use cherry tree because cherry trees weren't growing over there. You understand what I'm saying? They grow over here. Okay. So he will use what you have over here and you're familiar with to give you exactly the same message. All right. We know, okay, that he is going to be a redeemer and avenger of blood. Psalm 9, 12. I'm just giving you five minutes, please. I promise you five minutes. Okay. Psalm number 9, 12, because I know you're getting a little restless here. So am I. Psalm 9, 12. In the Tanakh, 12 and 13. Sing a hymn to Yahweh who reigns in Zion, declares deeds among the people. For he does not ignore the cry of the afflicted. He who requites bloodshed is mindful of them. We see him as the blood avenger. Psalm 79, Psalm number 79. Okay. 79, verse number 10. Let the nations not say, where is their God? Before our eyes, let it be known among the nations that you avenge the spilled blood of your servants. You understand what I'm saying? 
Psalm, Psalms of David. Okay, prophesying. There is a day of vengeance coming. Now, hello. Who has been the chief spiller of blood among the Jews? Christians. Through history. Ah. <laughs> Crusades. Okay, Holocaust. In the name of Jesus. Inquisition in the name of Jesus. Come on. Putting them in synagogues and setting them on fire in the name of Jesus. I go running next door, tell them they need to get it right. <laughs> the church has been the chief spiller of blood of the Jews or Israelites. In Revelation 6, 9 through 11, souls are crying out saying, how long, how long until we are avenged? Do you understand what I'm saying? The blood cries out, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Blood cries, was spilled on earth, will cry out in heaven against where it was said. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Deuteronomy 32, 35, vengeance is mine. We also see that in Isaiah 35, verse 4. I'm going to turn there real quick. Isaiah 35, verse 4. I'm almost finished, guys. I know this is long. Probably shouldn't have talked about that uh, New Testament stuff today, but. 35, verse 4. So you, you, I have to say, you guys, I need to toughen you up because if you go up to uh, uh, Detroit, they eat, then they start again. <laughs> okay, another six hours. Okay, 35 verse 4. Say to the anxious of heart, be strong, fear not. Behold your God, requital is coming, the recompense of God. He himself is coming to give you triumph. Come on now. Oh, sort of start that chapter. Okay, the reason is, is because of the next verses on that. When the disciples of John came, are you the one or do we look for another? What did he say to them? The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. This next verse says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, and the lame shall leap like a deer. Who's going to do that? When the one who fulfills the above comes. You understand what I'm saying? So Yeshua was saying to, the, to them, I am this one, so I am the one. They were believing there might be two. No, I am the one who's going to fulfill all of this. I'm the one to fulfill this now as a prophet like unto Moses, and that I am the one to be the blood avenger who's going to take vengeance. You understand what I'm saying? So star that because uh, that's an important verse. Okay, when Yeshua comes, he will come as the avenger of his people. He is the closest relative. We think Seth, okay, and all of them, Seth and Cain and Abel were the closest relatives to Adam and Eve, right? Because that's our physical mind. We don't understand, okay, Seth, Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve were not made in the image of God. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, their DNA is different because of sin. But originally, they were made in his image, no sin. So the only one who fits that criteria is Yeshua. So he is their closest relative. Thank God. Thank God. Okay. That he, we are being conformed, transformed into his very image. And that is how he becomes our kinsman redeemer. Everyone stand, please. We learned a lot today. Okay. Get the, get the, listen to the tape again and again. <laughs> and maybe a third time, okay? All right, because you can't get it all at once. All right, I didn't even go over the daughters of Zelophehad and the oaths and all that. It's just too much. You understand what I'm saying? I can if you want me to, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> After they eat, okay? Okay? But did you get anything out of a different revelation of a couple of things for today? That's important to understand. If nothing else, about gates, almond trees, all of that kind of stuff. Okay, so understand that. The kinsman, redeemer, all of that. All right. 
Before he formed you in the belly, he knew you. He ordained a purpose for you. Don't let anyone tell you your life is worth nothing. You understand? You are being conformed, transformed into the very image of our God. Look around you. We all look different. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. All the characteristics that he has, everybody here looks different. You understand what I'm saying? How are we trying to put God in a box? You understand what I'm saying? Father God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, we bless your holy name. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, that you've opened our eyes and given us eyes to see. We thank you, O Heavenly Father, that you've opened our ears and given us ears to hear. But most of all, O Lord, we thank you that you have circumcised our heart, O Heavenly Father, and given us a heart to receive your word. Father, I just want to thank you, O Heavenly Father, for these people, O Heavenly Father. And Lord, I ask you oh, to bless them. They are heirs of Abraham through faith in Yeshua HaMashiach. And your word says that you would bless them and that they would be a blessing, O Heavenly Father. And whoever blessed them would be blessed. Whoever cursed them would be cursed. And that they would be the standard through which blessings were ordained. So Father, when they go, O Heavenly Father, from this place, O Lord, ordain the environment that they are in to bring forth the resources that you call for them. Fulfill, show them to fulfill the purpose that you ordained for them before the final foundation of the world. Father, give them great favor that wherever they go, O oh Heavenly Father, the favor of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham will come upon them. And I want to thank you, O oh Heavenly Father, for all that you are doing in our lives and about to do. Lord, we pray for this nation. We pray for this world, O oh Heavenly Father, that there be a spirit of repentance to come in. But Father, we know ultimately you are the judge of all the earth and you shall do right, O oh Heavenly Father. Father. So those that are calling out to you for justice, you are the God of justice and we believe your will and your word. But we also know God, you are the God of compassion and that compassion for those who need it, judgment for those who deserve it. Oh, Heavenly Father, mercy for those who ask for it. Oh, Heavenly Father, all those things we know about you. So God, we want to praise you as our redeemer, as our avenger, as our healer, as our provider. Wherever someone reaches out today, oh heavenly father, Lord, fulfill their word, fulfill their prayer in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we ask amen and amen. Um, Ed, if you could just take the microphone and just say a prayer over a blessing over the food for everyone. God, we just thank you, Lord, for the message today and the message of God. And this word, Lord, go to the seed, Lord, go to us. Bless the food, Lord God, and bless the cook. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. All right. I meant to show you my bag over here. You can't see it, but I got a, uh, a won an award from Rotary. Okay, won an award. I was away, and they had a big uh, district meeting and everything. So when I came back, the uh, um, came back the other day, they came over to me and said, uh, you won this award and everything. They didn't have the certificate. I'll bring the certificate. You know, I didn't even know, you know, what it was for. And the reward was the uh, duffel bag, which Ed will become very familiar with as he carries it to and from, okay, my car and everything. But, you know, once again, I tell people, you don't have to run and jump out into anybody's face. God's Abrahamic promise gives you certain promises. From what I understand, the reward that, the award that I won, was for being the heart of the club. Okay, the very heart of the club. And that's because I do the prayer. Okay, they asked me to do the prayer. And that's the heart, revealing the heart of God towards the people and everything. And know that we have a senator in Washington, D.C. that has one of our prayers. Okay, I wrote a prayer for a senator that came to visit us. And he put that prayer on his wall in Washington, D.C. So I'm calling on that word to perform it. Okay. <laughs> calling on that word to perform it. So as I go uh, with the people, okay, in the back, you guys get ready. Uh, have a blessed meal. I'll be back in a couple of minutes. And thank you, Brad, for doing double duty.